Well, good morning, everybody. Welcome to our morning service. On this, the third Sunday of Lent, it's lovely to have you with us. Let's just quiet our hearts for a moment, and then we'll begin. Grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ be with you, and also with you. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. As we rejoice in the gift of this new day, so may the light of your presence, O God, set our hearts on fire with love for you, now and forever. And so we say together our introductory prayer. We've come together in the name of Christ to offer our praise and thanksgiving, to hear and receive God's holy word, to pray for the needs of the world, and to seek the forgiveness of our sins, that by the power of the Holy Spirit, we may give ourselves to the service of God. And so now we're going to have our first hymn. It's a lovely hymn to have to start with. It's, All My Hope on God is Founded. So now we come to our time of confession. Jesus says, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is close at hand. So let us turn away from our sin and turn to Christ, confessing our sins in penitence and faith. And so we say together, most merciful God, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, we confess that we have sinned in thought, word and deed. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. In your mercy, forgive what we have been. Help us to amend what we are and direct what we shall be, that we may do justly, love mercy, and walk humbly with you, our God. Amen. May the God of love and power forgive us and free us from our sins. Heal and strengthen us by his spirit and raise us to new life in Christ our Lord. Amen. Now we have a special prayer of thanksgiving appropriate for the Lenten season. Blessed are you, God of compassion and mercy. To you be praise and glory forever. 
In the darkness of our sin, your light breaks forth like the dawn and your healing springs up for deliverance. As we rejoice in the gift of your saving help, sustain us with your bountiful spirit and open our lips to sing your praise. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Blessed be God forever. And now John Mills is going to be bringing us our reading this morning. He's reading from John's Gospel, chapter 2, verses 13 to 22. This reading can be found in the second chapter of the Gospel of St. John, starting at the 13th verse. When it was almost time for the Jewish Passover, Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple courts he found men selling cattle, sheep and doves, and others sitting at tables exchanging money. So he made a whip out of cords and drove all from the temple area, both sheep and cattle. He scattered the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. To those who sold doves, he said, Get these out of here! How dare you turn my father's house into a market? His disciples remembered that it is written, Zeal for your house will consume me. Then the Jews demanded of him, What miraculous sign can you show us to prove your authority to do all this? Jesus answered them, Destroy this temple, and I will raise it again in three days. The Jews replied, It has taken 46 years to build this temple, and you're going to raise it in three days? But the temple he had spoken of was his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples recalled what he had said. Then they believed the scripture and the words that Jesus had spoken. This is the word of God. Thanks be to God. And now Michael Patterson is going to bring God's word to us. Let us pray. Lord, take my mind now and think through me. Take my heart and love through me. Take my lips and speak through me your words to teach and touch our hearts that we may glorify you in our lives for Jesus Christ's sake. Amen. <clears throat> now before any of you tells me that Matthew, Mark and Luke all place this episode of the clearing of the temple at the end of Jesus' ministry, let me say that since there is no Jerusalem ministry recorded in those Gospels, that they left it until Jesus was in Jerusalem. In other words, from Palm Sunday onwards. Or, perhaps it did happen in Jesus' early ministry, because that would explain Mark 3, verse 22, why people were sent from Jerusalem asserting that Jesus was possessed by Beelzebub, because no other explanation has been offered. Or, however unlikely, Jesus could just have cleared the temple twice. So, take your pick. And now down to the serious work. In obedience to the Torah, Jesus went up to Jerusalem to celebrate Passover. It was one of the three pilgrim festivals commanded by God. Now keen, as always, to emphasize Jesus' person and his work, John seems to suggest that this first visit to Jerusalem, since Jesus' ministry began, was made in the spirit of Malachi's prophecy. That's Malachi chapter 3 and verses 1 to 3. Suddenly, the Lord you are seeking will come to his temple, the messenger of the covenant whom you desire, but who can endure the day of his coming? For he will be like a refiner's fire. He will purify the Levites. And then the Lord will have men who will bring offerings in righteousness. Now when Jesus came to the temple, 
he found men selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and others sitting at tables exchanging money. Now, in one sense, these were necessary. Not everyone possessed a sheep for sacrifice, let alone a sheep that would pass the priest's inspection because it had to be flawless. So better to buy one guaranteed to pass inspection. Also, of course, you couldn't use Roman coinage in the temple. Hence, the money changers who set their own rates of exchange. And the priests allowed all this to happen in the temple courts. Jesus made a whip of cords, which was symbolic of the scourge, which in turn symbolized judgment. And he drove out all from the temple area both sheep and cattle. He scattered the coins of the money changers and he overturned their tables. Now, just imagine that scene. It must have been absolute chaos. Even a small whip laid across the backside of an ox or a sheep will encourage it to move and quickly. The traders trying to regain control the overturned tables and chairs everywhere ready to be tripped over, the neat piles of coins scattered and rolling around the floor, and the money changers scrabbling on hands and knees trying desperately to retrieve what was theirs, but impeded, of course, in their efforts by the frightened animals running amok. And to those who sold doves, he said, get these out of here. How dare you turn my father's house into a market? Matthew, Mark, and Luke record Jesus quoting Isaiah chapter 56 and verse 7 and Jeremiah 7 and verse 11 at this point, which Mark quotes in full. Is it not written, my house will be called a house of prayer for all nations, but you have made it a den of robbers? Those words, my house will be called a house of prayer for all nations, I understand, should be over the door of every synagogue, which is good to know that we are welcomed in there. Which brings us all to the reaction of the temple authorities, because you can't get away with a public action like that without having to answer for it. The temple authorities must have been furious and the whole episode must have lasted for quite a few minutes, such that when the authorities came to Jesus, the money changers must still have been trying to rescue their money. The authorities demanded, what miraculous sign can you show to prove your authority to do this? Jesus answered their challenge with a counter challenge. Destroy this temple and I will raise it again in three days. Words which clearly received wide circulation, for they were misquoted against Jesus at his trial. John explains that the temple of which Jesus had spoken was his body, but the authorities took him literally. It's taken 46 years to build this temple. It would take another 36 years to complete it, just in time for its complete destruction by the Romans in AD 70. And you are going to raise it in three days? An architectural impossibility. But there are two Greek words used here for temple. In the first part of today's reading, the word translated temple is hieron. But when Jesus said, destroy this temple, he deliberately used the other word, which is naos. Now, hieron is simply the temple, temple building, a, a general term. But naos was particularly the sanctuary in which God dwelt. Although Jesus said naos, the authorities clearly understood hieron, hence their incredulity. So what was Jesus telling them? Well, this, that his body, his body, 
was the true sanctuary in which God dwelt. And further, that if they destroyed his body, it would be raised to life again on the third day, which is exactly what happened. They crucified him on Good Friday, and God raised him to new life on the third day. So how does all this affect us? Well, first, by calling the temple my father's house, Jesus was proclaiming to all who would listen that he is the son of God, the Messiah. The temple, you see, was a powerful symbol of God's presence with his people, a symbol of his covenant and his promises. But there were problems the leadership had become corrupt. The priesthood was impure. False Maccabean priests uh, mingled with the sons of Levi and Aaron. And there was poor scholarship and teaching by these shepherds of Israel. And the temple precincts, of course, should not have been used for trade and profit. They polluted its holiness. It is actually worth noting here no one is recorded as to trying to stop Jesus from driving out the traders in, from the temple, even had it been stoppable. It's highly likely that Jesus' zeal was shared by many other pilgrims who had come to the temple truly and honestly to worship God. And then secondly, Jesus was not concerned with reforming the temple worship, rather with replacing it completely with something infinitely better in every way. And this would be achieved through his death and his resurrection. By taking our penalty on the cross for all my sins and for all your sins, for the sins of the whole world in fact, and by being raised to new life on the third day a new spiritual temple was made possible of all who believe. You do know, don't you, that because you believe, Jesus Christ lives in you. And as the Father is in Jesus, so your body is a temple of God. And as the fellowship of believers, we can say with St. Paul, we, we are the temple of God of the living God. Hallelujah. Amen. Our next hymn reminds us of just how much God loves us. Here is love, vast as the ocean.
So now we're going to declare our common faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. We say together, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead, on the third day he rose again, he ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. May Almighty God strengthen this faith in us. So now we have our special prayer or collect for the third Sunday of Lent. Almighty God, whose most dear Son went not up to joy, but first he suffered pain, and entered not into glory before he was crucified, mercifully grant that we, walking in the way of the cross, may find it none other than the way of life and peace. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. And now Di Daniels is going to bring us our prayers and intercessions and she'll conclude with the words of the Lord's Prayer. Let us pray. Everlasting God, be with us in this time of prayer and help us to feel your presence. Mindful of the commandments that you gave to Moses, we pray that you would be worshipped above all else in our land and that we can at all times be given the strength to reject the idolatry of our secular world. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For the health workers tending the seriously ill, for the scientists who have provided and are still working on vaccines, for the researchers analysing data and identifying trends, for the media outlets working to communicate reality, for the supermarket workers, hygiene and sanitation providers, for carers, the emergency services and teachers, for those who work in essential industries and services, for the good news stories of recoveries and effective planning. For the recognition that isolation doesn't need to mean loneliness. For the notes through letterboxes offering help and support. For the internet and telephones and technology that connects. For the awakened appreciation of what is truly important. Thanks be to God. For those who are unwell and concerned for loved ones. For those who were already very anxious. For those immune suppressed or compromised. 
for those vulnerable because of underlying conditions, for those in the most at risk to coronavirus categories, for those watching their entire income stream dry up, for those who have no choice but to go out to work, for those who are afraid to be at home, for those who are more lonely than they've ever been, for those who are bereaved and grieving. God, be their healer, comfort and protection. Be their strength, shield and provision. Be their security, safety and close companion. And raise up your church to be your well-washed hands and faithful feet, to be present to the pain, to respond with love in action, if even from a safe distance. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of grace and mercy, your son Jesus wept at the tomb of his friend Lazarus. Send your Holy Spirit on those who grieve, who struggle, and all who fear. Meet us in our times of questioning, anger, and doubt. Show us what we can do to enable one another to overcome isolation, distress, and despair. And make us a humbler people who know our need of you. In Christ's name, amen. Creator God, we pray for the governments of the world that they may always seek for peaceful solutions in their dealings with other nations and rule their own countries with compassion and justice. At this time of the worldwide pandemic, we especially pray for the leaders of our countries, states and cities as they seek to help manage the challenges of the economic impact of the virus in travel, manufacturing, hospitality, energy, or so many other industries. We pray for countries where freedom of speech is forbidden, remembering especially the people in Myanmar. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for our families, friends and neighbours, and for the people with whom we work or share our daily lives. We pray for those who are lonely, those isolated because of coronavirus, and those who find it difficult to make friends or be accepted. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Gracious God, we pray for all who are in pain or are suffering at this time. We remember especially those who are facing long or incurable illnesses, those who are suffering from bereavement, missing their loved ones, and finding it difficult to turn to you for comfort. In a moment of quietness, we pray for them and any we know who are in any kind of need at this time. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Faithful God, as we turn from our worship into the marketplace, which is our world, we thank you for the help you give us to resist the temptations that will assail in the weeks ahead. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Gathering our prayers and praises into one, let us pray as our Saviour has taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. 
Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Well, our final hymn this morning is that lovely hymn, Be Thou My Vision, O Lord of My Heart. So now we come to our closing prayer and blessing. Eternal God, give us insight to discern your will for us, to give up what harms us, and to seek the perfection we are promised in Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And we say together the words of the grace. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. And may the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you and all those you love this day and always. Amen. Well, thank you so much. That brings us to the end of yet another service. Please uh, join us again next week. We look forward to seeing you then. And please look out for that link and share it, as you know, with your family and friends and all those who might be interested. It's nice to get as many people as possible watching these online services. And finally, may I simply say that we are moving into that time of the year when all of the churches within the Necton Benefice have to have their annual parochial church meetings, the details of which will follow this service. Also, you'll find the details in the notes section of the YouTube webpage. So hopefully you'll be able to find them one way or another. If you're interested, possibly interested, in being a church warden or a member of one of the respective PCCs, either at Necton, North Pignum, Home Hell, please let us know and we'll provide you with the application forms. That really does now bring our service to a close. So thank you so much. Look after yourselves. Take care of one another. Goodbye, God bless, and we'll see you again next week.
If you would like to support the ministry of any of the churches within the Necton Benefice, then please see the notes under this service on the YouTube channel for All Saints Necton. Or you can, of course, contact me directly at slthorpe at outlook.com. God bless and thank you.